All right. I think we'll get started here in just a moment, please. We have a few people coming in still, and we had to add, um, add some extra chairs, which is wonderful. So thank you all for coming out tonight. So thanks for joining us uh, at Concordia College or virtually through our live stream for the main event of our 2021 One Book, One Community series. Since 2012, communities of Fargo, Moorhead, West Fargo have been selecting and reading an annual One Book, One Community title and engaging the theme through book discussions, film showings, art history presentations, and author talks. This is the 10th year of our One Book, One Community project. Collaborating this year on the project are nine organizations. I think that might be a, a record and it's been a great year. So the five public libraries from West Fargo, Moorhead and West, West Fargo, the three college libraries, so from Concordia College, Minnesota State University, Moorhead and NDSU, also the Historical and Cultural Society of Clay County, the Indigenous Association, and Moorhead Area Public Schools Indian Education. The program series is grateful for sponsorships from the following organizations, Concordia College Cultural Events, Friends of the Fargo Public Library, Friends of the West Fargo Public Library, Friends of the Moorhead Public Library, and Moorhead Community Education. Now I am going to turn it over to Holly Mackey. She's the interim director of the Indigenous, Indigenous Association and <laughs> associate professor at NDSU. There's so many people here, this is awesome. So this evening's author presentation is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund through the Legacy Amendment. To help us continue to receive funds for programs like this, we ask you to please fill out a survey and turn it to one of our event volunteers. I believe they'll be posted in the back. And, and if you're watching on the live stream, please fill out a couple of quick questions at the onebookonecommunity.org forward slash survey. And that's one is in the number one book, one community forward slash survey. So tonight, we are thrilled to bring you the author of this year's selection, Everything You Wanted to Know About Indians But Were Afraid to Ask, Dr. Anton Troyer. Dr. Troyer is the author of 18 books. He's received more than 40 prestigious awards and fellowships, including ones from the American Philosophical Society, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Science Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, the Bush Foundation, and the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation. He is a professor of Ojibwe at Bemidji State University and frequent speaker at both national and international events. His equity, education, and cultural work has put him on a path of service around the region, the nation, and the world. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dr. Anton Troyer. English? English. They asked me to come and spend an evening with you. They didn't say anything at all about using a foreign language like English. <laughs> I, I think I'm almost to the point now where I have the president and the deans at Bemidji State University convinced that when someone calls and asks for the Department of Foreign Languages to send them to the English department. <laughs> if they want modern languages, they can see me. I'm really, really excited to be here tonight to see all of you. And what we have planned for you is a, 
an interactive evening. So whether you're on the live stream or you're here in person with us, welcome. And you can start thinking about your questions. We will be taking as many of those as we can this evening. I thought I'd, uh, I'd give us a little kickstart, though. First of all, I suppose I should uh, cover what I just said in Ojibwe. People smarter, older, and wiser than me, my elders say, when you meet someone new, follow our protocol. Tell them your native name, your clan, and where you're from. So that's kind of what I was doing. My native name is Wagush. That means fox. I'm from the Eagle Clan. So I'm sporting my native bling here tonight. And, uh, and I'm from Leech Lake, which is right in the middle of northern Minnesota. And I'm very happy to see you all. So here's one of my mentors, Tom Stilday. And uh, he was pretty well known in Minnesota. He passed away a few years ago. And he was the first person who had been named chaplain for the Minnesota State Senate who was not from one of the Abrahamic religious traditions. So that was him with his pipe opening up the Senate. He had a great sense of humor, too. He said, I'm praying for politicians. Boy, do they need it. <laughs> More than ever. It was quite prescient. And, uh, and so he was a lot of fun. We, one time we had him at the university to give a graduation banquet speech. And I was kind of pushing for it. I said, you know, instead of an academic person or a politician, let's bring in someone with a PhD in the school of life. And uh, so I convinced them to bring in Tom. And then I had to speak to Tom on the side because he was kind of notoriously long-winded. And I said, this is a graduation event. Keep it short, 10, 15 minutes. Throw in a joke or two. Focus on the students. So he spoke for about an hour and a half. <laughs> and uh, it was all in Ojibwe. And then he's, he only said one thing in English when he was done. He said, all you people who study Indians, study that. And he went and sat down. <laughs> so I thought he was great. And he had some good points. Most of the books written about Native stuff have been written by non-Native people, many of whom have hardly even talked to one, much less spent time in a Native place. It's weird. Like, we wouldn't dare, you know, take seriously a book on German history by someone who never went to Germany and didn't speak German and actually probably do some primary source research in German, French, and English. But somehow you can be an authority on indigenous stuff without really representing or connecting deeply with those communities. That is starting to change, and honestly, just over the past 20 years, and really accelerating the past several years, there's been an explosion of indigenous authored works, and it's really exciting. There's lots of new stuff going on in uh, works, especially for young readers, uh, but in all sorts of genres. And also, most of the stuff that you've read, even about history of Native people, is probably way out of date. If it's uh, older than 10 years old, like right now, the fields of linguistics and genomics and archaeology, they're all talking to each other in ways that never happened before. And so we probably have more questions than answers about some of this stuff, but it's been really interesting, shifting, changing constantly. Also, you know, there's been a lot going on in our current events. You could look at just even this week, there was a, a high school teacher dressed in faux native regalia for a math class hopping around doing caricature type stuff that made a big drama and was all over the the news and sparking protests we've had all kinds of stuff in relation to the value of the lives of people of color uh, our politics are as testy as ever and it's more important than ever that we figure out how to get along, how to build some bridges, and how to work towards meaningful solutions around everything from climate change to race relations to politics. And it's daunting. But at the same time, there's some really great stuff going on. I thought I'd give you a minute or two just on me, not because that's the most important thing you need to know, but simply because nobody sees the world the way that it is we all see the world the way that we are, and we're all different. 
So this will just help us frame our, our, our conversation. There's home for me, Leech Lake, epicenter of the universe, even though not everybody knows it yet. <laughs> I'm on a mission. All of us as human beings have ancestors, of course, but I think something about the American experience, whether it was voluntary, involuntary, or under duress, most Americans have had a process of disconnecting from mother land and mother tongue. And some of us lament these things. Like my next door neighbor as a childhood, Albert Swenson, you know, was a great Norwegian speaker. And he was only the third generation in his family living in the United States. He would go to the Democratic Precinct caucuses and they'd caucus in Norwegian, which by the way was like super American and kind of quintessentially Minnesotan. And now if you're not speaking English at a precinct caucus, man, you might get thrown out of there. You know? He's probably turning in his grave, right? And for him, keeping those connections alive and meaningful were really an important part of identity. But the American experiment doesn't accommodate those things that well. Most people know their parents and grandparents, know the names of their great-grandparents, and beyond that, might not know their names or even where they're buried. They'll have a couple of kids, and they'll end up in different states. And then we use Facebook and FaceTime, and we try to keep it real. But it's not the case that everybody's growing up best friends with their cousins, and they kind of feel like siblings. You know, it, it's shifting and changing. It's not that Native people are immune to those kind of pressures, shifts, and changes, too. We're, we're feeling that. But at the same time, one of the defining features of being indigenous is connection to place. And it also often translates into a different kind of connection to one's ancestors and things like that. So for me, with the very ancient face, it would be on the left-hand side of your screen up there, is this gentleman who ironically got the name John Smith later in life. No connection to the one from Pocahontas legend, obviously. But uh, he was born in the 1700s, and he died in the 1900s. So he, he had a very long life, and he was here in Minnesota before white settlement, and he was still here when they were getting ready to send people off to World War I. Amazing to think about the changes he must have seen during his lifetime. And on the other side of the screen, Wabujig, who is kind of a famous warrior in the Ojibwe world, but not necessarily anyone, anyone else would know an awful lot about. And I never had the tools to talk about this when I was going to school, but it started to bother me as I got older that it would be possible to go to school for 13 years in a row, K-12, to learn whatever I needed to be successful in the world, and none of it had anything to do with me. It was kind of like the message was from really good-hearted people who actually wanted me to succeed, even if the definitions of success were kind of narrow. But the, the goal was to help me be successful, and the message is screaming at me through the absent narratives were that you and yours are not important, not relevant, and don't matter. Which felt like the continuation of an age-old assault on my very way of being. And how do we react when we feel assaulted? It's like fight, flight, freeze. And so a lot of times the professionals in education are scratching their heads. How come we have these truancy issues with our students of color? Black, indigenous, and people of color, right? Truancy? Well, that's flight. How come we've got these discipline issues? I'm like, well, that's fight. How come some are like spaced out, zoned out, and disengaged? Freeze. And of course, it's not quite that simple, but it's part of what's going on. Imagine for just a minute if roles reversed. Could you imagine like white kids in America going to school? and learning all about, for example, the beauties of Arab culture, 
cuisine, our understanding of the zero, innovations in mathematics and navigation, but never anything about themselves or how people from their group helped make the world a better place? Well, it's hard to imagine because this is America, right? But that is the experience for people from many marginalized groups. So that was always cooking in the back of my mind through my childhood experience. And uh, I'll give you a little bit on my folks. So my father was not native at all. He was an Austrian Jewish immigrant, a Holocaust survivor. He spoke nothing but German the first 13 years of his life. He has an amazing story of his own. It's almost like several different stories. And I'm happy as we get to questions to field both the personal as well as professional kinds of questions, wherever you want to take me. Um, but I'll give you the kind of short, a couple snippets from the uh, highlights from his many iterations. At age 13, he escaped, and he and two cousins, and both of his parents eventually made it out. Uh, and everyone else was killed in the camps, about 300 immediate family members. And then he spent about a year in England and Ireland while his mother worked for enough money for a passage to America, uh, made it here. By the time he was here, he was 14. At age 17, he lied about his age and, and enlisted in the U.S. Army, hoping to go kill Nazis, and they sent him to the Pacific Theater. <laughs> and then uh, he started and restarted his life many different times. And the short version of the the restarts would be eventually he made his way to Minnesota, met my mom, and here I am. My mom had a quite an amazing journey of her own. She's Ojibwe from Leech Lake, little village of Bina, so if you cruise across Highway 2, like on your way to Duluth, don't blink or you'll miss it. And uh, probably about half of the people in the village are my cousins. But when she was going to school, I think she had a pretty visceral experience with poverty. So things like harvesting wild rice and snaring rabbits was less a cool cultural pastime and more a necessary means of survival. The kids actually had to participate in food production. And she only met one professional native person ever, her whole childhood. And that person was the school nurse. So she said, well, I can do that. So she went on to become a nurse. And then from there, she got really interested in what was going on at a political level with tribes, and she ended up becoming the first female native attorney in the state of Minnesota. And so I got to see big changes for, you know, through the course of my life as each of my parents were on their own kind of life-altering trajectories. I sometimes hesitate to show a slide like this, which has you know, depressing economic data on my hometown. But there's a great TED Talk. If you haven't had a chance, check it out. This Nigerian literary figure, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, has a TED Talk called The Danger of a Single Story. And uh, if you can't remember her name, you can look for The Danger of a Single Story. It has millions of, of views and so forth on YouTube. And among the great things she says in there is that the problem with stereotypes is not so much that they are incorrect as much as they are incomplete. And they tell us a really narrow, single story, and we use that to understand the experience of an entire group of people. So, for example, if we wanted to study, like, white folk, and we only studied poor white people in rural Appalachia, we wouldn't understand what it means to be white in America. We'd understand a single story, narrow experience. And we might be thinking, white people, oh, the methamphetamine, it's terrible, right? And we'd be missing the whole breadth of experiences. Same thing if you just looked at New York's Upper East Side and, and think, whew, white people, everything handed on a silver platter, wow. Of course, neither can explain the whole breadth of experiences. So imagine the competing stereotypes about natives. One says we're all rich from casinos. Another says we're all living in squalor on reservations. And the truth is, neither single story narrative is going to tell you everything you need to know. 
in Minnesota, in 16 counties, tribes are not just big employers. They are the biggest employers of all. Be nice to natives, you probably end up working for one someday. <laughs> and at the same time, about 50% of native kids live below the poverty line. And it's not as simple as how come these folks aren't helping these folks. You could say that how come those rich white folk on New York's Upper East Side aren't helping those poor white folks in rural Appalachia too. It doesn't mean that they don't care, but it's humans and it's complex. So, give you just a little bit more. There was me as a tyke. When my folks were getting started, I guess you could say my mother was trying to find a pathway out of poverty. My father was hitting the restart button. For a while, we had a little cabin. It was about 24 feet by 24 feet. And uh, we washed up in the creek in the summer, enamel wash basins in the winter. We did have a little hand pump, but no running water. Kerosene lanterns, no electricity. You know, for me, that was like awesome. I had my parents to myself, didn't have food insecurity, life was great. And as my mother eventually pursued her law degree, she did that in Washington, D.C. And so I had this experience going back and forth between being an Indian and being the Indian. <laughs> and uh, between the res and a big city. And it was a great perspective builder. Didn't always feel great at the time. And, uh, but it was really fascinating. By, by the time my, I'd hit middle school, that's when my mom had her law degree, built a nice house for our family, the economic profile changed, and uh, it revealed a couple things to me. So one was obviously the power of an education. That's real. By the way, an education is not a guarantee of more money or something like that, but it's a lever that increases your chances of more equitable access to opportunity. Plenty of people finish college and end up working at Starbucks, but for those who enter other kinds of professions, usually it's a really important tool to help them climb and accelerate forward. At the same time, I'm still kind of with George Carlin. We call it the American dream because you gotta be asleep to believe it. <laughs> By that simply meaning that there are barriers out there and those barriers are not equitably distributed by gender, by race, by all kinds of other things. The life expectancy for a Native American man in North Dakota is 54.7 years. They tell you to save money for retirement. That's not fair. And it's not because of bad morals. It's because those barriers are not equitably distributed. It's not as simple as wanting to work. So, that's what I mean by that one. There's my crew. I have nine kids. It is never dull. By the way, if anyone here likes kids, I will send you a couple. <laughs> and I know the ones I'll send you. It's been really fun watching them with, uh, with the pandemic. Well... I'm not sure fun's the right word. Interesting. So they're very creative. Like the 14-year-old was, was uh, you know, having a tough time. So he would uh, change his screen name to reconnecting dot, dot, dot and shut off the, the video feed. And he would just take a nap or mess around, you know. It's like if you applied yourself with this much cleverness to your homework. Yeah. But they were, they were really pretty fun. We had all kinds of, uh, I could tell you a lot of crazy kids' stories, too, about, uh, about what they were up to. But it was really fascinating to watch, really, how people learn. So I was like, anything to keep their heads in the game, you know. So the, one of the kids said, I need birdseed. I was like, birdseed? Okay, birdseed. So I got some. So he'd go outside with a hat on with a brim and put birdseed on there, put some in his hands and stand there. <laughs> he would do it for, like, hours. So I'm watching, taking little videos. But it, it was like Dr. Doolittle. It started to work. <laughs> Pretty soon there'd be like birds would come into his hand and on the brim of his hat and he'd just stand there, you know. <laughs> and then, uh, then he was like, Dad, I need, I need to learn more about this. I was like, okay, you know, field guide to the birds, whatever. And, I'll, you know, 
it was crazy, but after about, you know, some weeks of this, we're sitting at the kitchen table, and I was saying, you know, tell me what you're learning. He says, well, check this out. Do you see these ones? These are called cedar wax wings. They're a little different than the bohemian wax wings because of this and that and how they're colored. And these ones, those are red poles. They look kind of like a chickadee, but they're marked a little bit differently. And they behave differently, too. You notice these ones, the blue jays, they're kind of loud, but they're actually kind of shy. They're standoffish, except for that one. His name's Jerry, you know. <laughs> and, and so they're like, he had, he had learned all this stuff, you know. So I think for a lot of us, too, when we can speak to someone in their learning language, in their cultural language, boy, what a difference that can make. I'm in the grandbaby business now, too. I've got three of those. And they're getting a little older. We launched our sixth kid now. You know, three left at home. There's the view off the front deck of my house. I kind of feel like Shrek. That's my swamp. Among the things that had happened when my folks were getting started, my dad had put in a bid on a piece of tax forfeited property back in the 1950s. And he got a letter back saying, well, yours is the only bid, but it's not enough money to cover the delinquent taxes. He must have really lowballed them. And uh, can you find a couple hundred extra bucks, which he borrowed and got a pretty good sized piece of property for really relatively little money. And at some point, it had been a virgin white pine forest, but it was clear cut and turned into farm fields. So when he got it, it looked like this. And what he did is he started planting trees. And in fact, he planted all of the trees in this picture, and it completely transformed the landscape and the ecosystem. Remarkable. And uh, that was one, one person with a child labor force. That was me. <laughs> and... But what a remarkable change. And, and I think for all of us, when we look at the big issues, things like climate change, politics, race relations, you know, we look at that stuff and think, oh, there's not a lot I can do about it. I try to be a decent human being. I'll tell my kids to be decent human beings, and I hope it's enough, and it's never quite enough because all that's necessary for evil to triumph is good people to do nothing or too little. But it's not like we need to take the mountain of problems that humans have been making for thousands of years and like move that whole mountain right now. It's more like we need to keep planting the seeds. And it can transform the landscape and the entire ecosystem. And that's the work on all of the issues. It's why things like tonight are so important. Where we, we should really honestly take all the people we want to give a good talking to and give them a good listening to. Most of us have a pretty racially homogenous favorites list on our smartphones. We're more segregated than we were before desegregation. It's weird. Like we'll see each other at the gas station or the Walmart, which is kind of like the happy, happy hunting grounds. You know, it's like everything you need and everyone you know. But ultimately, we actually have to do some extra work, make some extra efforts. And frankly, reading books, having deep, meaningful conversations, travel, education, these sorts of things can be quite fatal to prejudice. And so it warms my heart and gives me a lot of hope to see you all tonight leaning in and to think about all of the work that many of you are doing throughout these communities to help make them and the world a better place. Planting the seeds. All right. Well, we do some of this stuff too. I, I'm sometimes hard to figure out because I code switch and I change, code, I change clothes a lot. So, you know, people have a very different impression if I'm, uh, you know, in my powwow outfit, dressed up like this, if I'm traveling or if I'm you know, home on the res or chasing my crazy mob of kids around or, or whatever. Um, but among the hats I get to wear, uh, because I'm a, an Ojibwe speaker and I'm somebody who kind of officiates at a lot of our ceremonies, from life ceremonies to funerals and things like that, is I am, I am tethered to my community. And I frequently turn down jobs to go work somewhere else so that I can be there at the service of our people. 
I don't have any regrets, though. All of the grandparents for my kids have been within 10 minutes of the front door throughout their upbringing. Um, just my mother passed away in, in 2020 at the start of the pandemic, and my father in 2016. But throughout all of the different chapters in their lives, they were right, you know, mingling in on a daily basis with my kids or my next door neighbors. So, uh, so that was just really beautiful and powerful too. And I've learned that it's not just spread your wings and fly, but cultivating your roots that provides a lot of meaning for life, at least for me. So we do stuff like this. We harvest uh, wild rice. We make maple syrup and sugar. And to me, our cultural toolbox is really, really beautiful and powerful. And once we get into questions, feel free to ask about anything you want. So I, I do a lot of work with indigenous language revitalization. I do a lot of work with our culture. So if you're curious about that stuff, um, but if you want to ask about tribal sovereignty, current events, hot topics, whatever you want is fair game. And, you know, I could share some stories about my experiences, you know, as uh, someone who is going back and forth between native and non-native space. I'll just kind of skip through the next couple slides, but we can come to it with, uh, with your questions. I sometimes use this analogy, like if I hold up my finger and say, what is this? I could start a fight unless we clarify in what language. Because in the language of body parts, that's a finger, right? But in the language of numbers, well, that's a one. In the language of space, that's up. So who's right? And of course, they're all right, but it's a matter of perspective, right? And here's what happens. If we're going to have a, a conversation, especially about a tough topic like race, someone's up there saying this here is a finger, it's not an elbow, it's not a toe. The rest of you, shh. And somebody's listening going, that's a one, not a two. See, they just don't understand. And we totally miss each other. But if we can look at this and from multiple perspectives, then we can start to see we can start to see things in a very different way as a finger as one as up and all the other many things that it can be and when we get really good at it we kind of get multicultural by the way this is great advice if you ever want to like have a friend be in a marriage have a kid work in a workplace with more than two people you know Often, we see things quite differently. So that's, that's a powerful tool to try to look at the world from other people's perspectives. So a little bit on the book, and then we'll start fielding questions. So I've been just really excited about the reception that this particular um, book has had. We, uh, when I got started, whoops, when I got started with this, it was really by accident, I think, like a lot of high schoolers, I finished high school and my goal was to get out of town and never come back. And uh, I thought I was going to be escaping like the brambled racial borderland of my youth. And I even had some like very painful experiences, even with like physical racial violence directed at me. And I was like, I'm out. And uh, I got into Princeton University and I thought, oh, this will be great. They'll be, like, educated. The ignorance will be behind me. And I think the first question was, dude, where's your tomahawk? And I was like, what? You know, these must be the dumbest smart people I've ever met. It's starting all over again. There's no way away from the brambled racial borderland. It follows me everywhere I go, you know. Or like Godfather 2, every time I get out, they're pulling me back. And so there's nothing like leaving home to actually help you appreciate what you just left behind. So then, of course, I got homesick. And at one point, you know, Princeton's out in New Jersey. I, I heard that there was this, like, Native American spiritual leader coming to New Jersey. She's Comanche. And she was going to run sweat lodge ceremonies. And I'm, I'm kind of naive, but I, I was just smart enough to know that there are weirdos and Fruit Loops and charlatans. Maybe this was one. What are the Comanche doing in New Jersey? They're from Oklahoma and Texas. But 
I thought, well, if it's anything like home, I, I got to go check this out. So I went out there. It's maybe four or five in the afternoon. And there were about 20 white people waiting for the sweat lodge ceremony. But they were all completely naked. <laughs> so we're driving up and I'm looking and like part of me wanted to laugh because dang, you know, there's 20 naked people standing around in the woods. Like, what can you do? <laughs> like, do you take pictures? Like, you know. And then uh, part of me wanted to run because dang, there's 20 naked people standing around in the woods. Like, Part of me was also getting mad, like, dang, is that what they think we're all about? So being naive, I, I stopped, got out, and I was immediately folded into a tight embrace by one of these naked strangers who's now hugging me hard, <laughs> awkward, and saying, you know, I'm so sorry what my people did to your people. So now this is like cringeworthy experience. The desire to like laugh, run, get mad is growing and growing. And I looked at this woman's face, she was an elder. There were tears welling up in her eyes. And it occurred to me that no matter how misguided she was, yes, she was misguided, that her emotional response was sincere. And the thing that happens to people from a marginalized group that doesn't happen to you as much if you're not is where you get asked to be the spokesperson for an entire group of people. And it also occurred to me that if I just walked away, she'd just keep thinking what she's thinking. If I got mad and snaked out and told her off for ignorance that was not of her own making, that the only native she met would be an angry one. So I had to think fast. And so I said, um, ma'am, could you put some clothes on? Because I would love to talk to you about all of this. And she did. And uh, we actually had a good talk. And I think she learned a few things, but I did too. I could have titled the book Lessons from a Naked Stranger in the New Jersey Woods. <laughs> and so uh, among the things that I learned is that it's really important to make safe space, to give people a meaningful answer, not just an angry rebuke. All of us, myself included, went to school in a country that gave us a sugar-coated version of Chris Columbus in the first Thanksgiving. And not a lot else to go on to more deeply understand the first people of the land. So much so that there's so little about contemporary Native experiences that some people think we actually are something that happened in the past. Like I've actually been told it's a shame they killed all the Indians. And I'm like, wait, I'm feeling pretty good today. You know, are you trying to tell me something, you know? But it's that level of impact on people's consciousness. Sometimes we experience hyper-visibility, right? So when you are in a place um, like Bemidji, which is 24% native and maybe 40 plus percent of the shopping population's native, then we experience hyper-visibility racial profiling, stuff like that. But very often, especially outside of some indigenous context, we experience invisibility and marginalization. And both may be special discomforts, you know, depending on the context of our experience. So what I started doing, like, honestly, my mother was you know, had a law degree, became a judge. By the time I finished high school, I would have been hard pressed to explain to you, here's what tribal sovereignty is and how it works. Like, I just wasn't tuned in. I was in high school. I was hoping girls would look at me, which didn't happen until about college. You know, like, um, so I knew what it was like living in this body. I knew what it was like, you know, having braids or, well, man bun today. You know, but... I didn't have all of the answers. So I had to go hunt for them. And it's been quite a quest. I started saving the questions, and the questions came up like, is it actually Indian? Or is it Native American, Aboriginal, Indigenous, First Nation person, or, or what? And there's nothing like not even knowing how to frame a question to paralyze a conversation, you know? So somewhere on terminology, somewhere on politics, somewhere on you know, what is sovereignty and how does it work? 
Also, like what's going on with economics? What's happening with culture? Um, how different are the Ojibwe and the Dakota and other tribes? Uh, what's going on with all of the mascots stuff? Pipeline protests. Um, how do you speak to the value of native lives in the context of Black Lives Matter? What can I do to make a difference? And so I started saving up the questions and hunting for the answers, and it's been really a lot of fun. I, I was initially starting off giving talks and trying to field as many questions as I could. And I got to give you a couple of, of uh, warnings first. First of all, I got a house full of natives, and I don't even know what they're thinking most of the time. <laughs> so I represent one person. In spite of the cute title, you know, I only represent one person's view. There are 574 federally recognized tribes, numerous other state recognized tribes, and many others that are not recognized by any federal or state government. And they're not all the same. Some of the languages are as different as Chinese and English. Some, you know, go to Navajo Nation, there are 160,000 fluent Navajo speakers in the center of the reservation, you know, and for some, their tribal language is, it's gone. It's not the same everywhere. Um, some, like the Seminole tribe in Florida, have completely eliminated poverty for 100% of their enrolled tribal citizenry. And most native people, as I mentioned before, about 50% of native kids are still below the poverty line. So it's complex. And I can only represent one person's view, and I am shaped by all of me my parents, my age, my gender, my life experiences. So as we field questions, I can give you perspective, uh, but any other Native person may have a completely different perspective. And just like we wouldn't ask one white person, what do white people think about abortion, good or bad? <laughs> and expect it to be that simple or easy or to have everybody answer that the same way. So it'll be like that for me too. Um, especially with cultural things, you know, we see quite a bit of variation. Uh, and if I, you know, if you come up with a really good stumper of a question and I don't know, I will say, I don't know. Yeah, so I'll shoot straight with you. And with that, here's how we're going to roll. Um, if you are joining us through the live stream, there's a protocol for you to drop your questions there and someone will funnel them up here to me. And then just so we can hear one another, we've got a mic up here, and we'll just invite you to come on up and you can shout out some questions. If you feel a little shy, um, then you can write them down and pass them forward and someone else will read your questions. So whatever methods you want. Frankly, there'll never be enough time to field all your questions here tonight either. So a couple of other things that I can point out to you. One is um, I've got lots of free stuff for you. So. Um, on my website, I've got lists of books and resources for teachers, for example. Uh, I've got a YouTube channel, so there are lots of, you know, little shorts on various topics, so you can, let th that stuff's all free. Um, I do a lot of public speaking, so there's also on the website, there's a events calendar, you know, and a lot of things are virtual, so even if I'm not right here again, in the immediate future, I'll be somewhere on your computer if you're interested in that too. And then a lot of those things archive and get posted online for free too. I'm not sure with this one. I think, will it eventually be posted for free too? Yep, and so this one will be up there for free too. So, uh, so lots of different ways to connect and engage. Plus there's, you know, phone numbers and emails and things like that. All right, who wants to get us started? Don't be shy. Yep, go right ahead. Buju, Wayne and Dijanakas, and now Quezona de Indugu, Makwa Indu Dame, Bawa Ting and Dunjaba. So there's some great things going on with language in early childhood, um, in like Red Lake, Leech Lake, in their programs. Um, what are some strategies to kind of get young adults, um, college age, high school age, into the language and learning the language? Yeah, great question. So one of my other titles, the Language Warriors Manifesto, How to Keep Our Languages Alive No Matter the Odds, is all about exactly this, where, um, you know, 
kind of my own language journey, a collective one, um, and advice and guidance, um, pitfalls and things to do. Specifically with Ojibwe, since that's you know what you're what you're asking about, we're a huge group of people. So from Bawating over in Sault Ste. Marie, kind of in the center of Ojibwe country, uh, we span across Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, North Dakota. There's even a mixed Ojibwe Cree community in Montana at Rocky Boy. And then in Canada, 141 Ojibwe First Nations in Canada from the Quebec border to Saskatchewan. So we're huge, huge. And huge geographic spread, lots of variation, even dialect um, differences within the language family. And in some areas like the Severn region of Ojibwe, there's 100% fluency. But it's like you need a float plane or a boat to get into some of those communities. They're, they're much more isolated. And here in the US, you know, our fluency rates are much lower, and it's mainly elders who are speakers. Um, but that is starting to change. So um, Lakoudere, which is one of the Ojibwe communities in Wisconsin, um, has an Ojibwe immersion school that's been going for over 20 years now. And there's something that didn't happen since World War II, because there's a whole bunch of little kids running around hollering at each other on the playground in the language. Not everybody lives in that community. So how do you get access to the language if you don't live there. And a lot of us are working really hard on that, so I'm excited. I, um, this is a little bit of a sidebar and maybe a longer answer for your question, but, um, but interesting to me anyways. Uh, probably about three years ago, I went to this meeting in Mille Lacs in central Minnesota, and they said, hey, could you look at our grants? We've got some overages and we want to do some stuff with language. It's like, overages? How much? And they said, well, it's, it's about $14 million. I was like, this is what you need to do. And, uh, and so I like pitched everything in my dream list, you know? And they're like, let's do it all. Yeah, so we're developing Rosetta Stone. Um, and there'll be, um, each year of Rosetta Stone will have about 40 language units. And they use, you know, audio, video, flashcards, assessments, different things like that. And so we'll have six full years developed. So year one releases right around Christmas time. And then there'll be another year released every year for the next six years. The nice thing there is like half the tribal population lives off res. And not every res has as vibrant a language program. So that will be something that'll come to you wherever you're at. We're developing literary traditions for what used to be an oral language. So um, we just released five new books with the elders in Mille Lacs. Um, we had to work through COVID conditions, and we started off convening with big groups before COVID. We had to go to remote work, um, and that was a big test. I ended up sending one of the grandkids for each elder to their house with a computer <laughs> to turn on Zoom and uh, get us started. <laughs> yeah. And they were like, nope, Grandma, it's right here, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but it worked. One time I, we, we called uh, Carol Nickerboy, and she's one of the elders down in... Um, down in Mille Lacs, and uh, so I caught her, and she said, oh, Wagush, well, I was going to go to the casino, but oh, yeah, the language is more important. Okay, well, let's get busy. So we sat down, started working. We are working for a couple hours, and she goes, well, I'm going to the casino now. My niece has been waiting in the car the whole time. <laughs> so, yeah, she was pretty dedicated. Her niece, too, obviously, yeah. So it was pretty fun, and, and so, you know, I still think it's fair to classify what's happening with Ojibwe as emerging. Like, to be really successful, you know, like English, for example, has about 5,000 books loaded into an accelerated reader program tagged by grade level. So, like, you know, even a kindergartner is learning letters, a first grader is learning sight words. Sometimes by the end of second grade, kids are reading Harry Potter books and stuff. Like, the, the literacy development for a young child is amazing. So we need the full array of resources to do that successfully. And when, when I started, you could count the books on a couple hands. Now there's hundreds of them, but we're not to 5,000 yet, you know? And, uh, and so we, we need that level of depth um, to have literacy work. And um, so it's fair to say we're emerging, and there are some success stories. There are setbacks, too. You know, we lose people every year. 
COVID has been really tough. Um, I figure about 20% of our fluent speakers of Ojibwe in Minnesota died during COVID. Yeah, so it's no joke. And um, at the same time, we have had new gains, you know, new schools and programs developing, new resources coming out. You know, it's not all tragedy. It's not all, you know, sunshine and roses. It's all mixed together, which I guess kind of is life for all of us, you know, of every background in many ways. Um, so tools and resources. I have also on the website, like Ojibwe language resources. I got a bunch of stuff posted on the Bemidji State University website that can kind of point you to more too. Okay. So I have a question on our form, which I'm very excited about. But if you guys have a question and you're feeling kind of shy, you don't want to come up here, it's onebookonecommunity.org backslash question. I'll read your question. I'll be the designated question asker. Uh, the first question that I got in here was, what fiction books by Native authors do you recommend? Oh, man. There's so much good stuff going on. So I... I I just read a couple months ago Angeline Bouley's The Firekeeper's Daughter, which is a, a big deal now. Um, she's been getting a lot of critical acclaim and she's gonna get a Netflix deal, you know, inked and so forth. And, uh, and so that one's really taking off. But I, I found that one to be, that was a work of fiction. Uh, you know, made for young readers, not the very youngest kids, but you know, it's appropriate for high schoolers and up, I would say. Um, but, you know, it just kind of a page turner, you know, elegantly plotted story, well written, and with an authentic both urban and reservation native experience. Also from Bawating, um, you know, so I thought her stuff was really great. Um, Darcy Little Badger has two books out that are just off to the races and I think really quite amazing. And there's just, there's a whole bunch of work going on in the young reader realm that's really, really exciting. So again, resources up on the website and lots more work out there. Nana Baju, wish could be Jinabi, quite digital cause, and Chemi Gwich, Mr. Troyer, for um, coming today. Um, Madudu Swan and Opagwin um, and the Dewagon um, is what I do. Um, I have one in my backyard in Dilworth. Um, I've Sundance for 15 years. And also gone through ceremonial rite of passage as far as Hombletcha, Vision Quest, uh, seven times. Mm -hmm. And um, with the five of my grandchildren I have, every one of them has their name. Mm -hmm. And um, so I have a gift for you. I didn't know how long the line would be, but I brought a Grandpa Rock for you tonight. As, oh, miigwech. Uh, as a big miigwech um, for coming tonight. And as being a wisdom keeper, um, it was very important for my grandchildren to be um, exposed and, and inspired by indigenous people who um, keep pushing forward. Mm -hmm. It makes me emotional because it is emotional mm -hmm. because um, the elders told me that happiness comes through tears and for that I'm very grateful. Um, one of the things that I hope the Western, we're standing in this college today and one of the hardest things, I don't find it hard now because I've come I've been um, living the ways for a long time as far as uh, ceremonial rite of passage and, and going, um, conducting ceremonies. And the education that my grandchildren got when COVID came was what I prayed for. I prayed that mm. they would have a time out from the Western school because learning begins in the home. So we cut wood, we go get grandfathers, we harvest medicines, go to the Sundance grounds, you know, um, practice language. But that needs to be acknowledged when children um, are missing school, give them credit for what they're learning at home. Give them credit in mathematics. Give them credit in um, history. Give them credit in life skills. Um, and so I wanted to um, encourage educators or uh, wanting um, soon to be educators that wanna go into that, that to really acknowledge that part of things. And then the last part of my question was um, uh, Madewa and Moan. Um, and how many communities, my, the group of grandchildren that I have with me tonight um, are Lakota. Um, they are part Lakota and part Ishinaabe and Cree. And they've been to both. They've been both ways. Mm -hmm. um, but in the future, if they ever wanted to go to Madewan, 
um, to see that ceremony. How many exist in Manishota? Because it bothers me, people say Minnesota wrong. It's Manishota, it's a Dakota word. <laughs> and, um, um, and again, I ask uh, forgiveness for speaking in front of my elders, but it's important to know. Um, but I'd like to know how many Medewin ceremonies are actively um, um, going on in Manishota that you are aware of. Mi okay. Chim yeah, miigwech. And I'll come find you and I'll get some tobacco for you too for the, oh. for the <laughs> grandfather. Mm -hmm. So a couple things. Um, first of all, with regard to the um, Medewiwin ceremonies, you know, the real substance of what we do at those is kind of given to people as part of their initiation. So I won't go too deep into that here, but there are several active lodges um, in, in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Uh, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. Ontario, uh, and so it used to be that every community had one of these and, you know, people just went through wherever they were from and now we end up traveling around a little bit, but there are several and if you want, maybe afterwards I can kind of write down, you know, names of each of the communities and mm -hmm. some contact information so you can get connected and check one out. Okay, Chemiguich, should I yep. just set this up there? Okay, sure, here. How miigwech? Yeah, I, I find our cultural toolbox to be so powerful. There are so many different um, stories that I could share with you, but especially those rites of passage, I, I feel like what's in our cultural toolbox both reflects the values of our people and it also shapes the values of our people. So there's a lot more to share there. Go right ahead. Hi. I live in North Dakota, just across the river, about 20 miles. And um, that's because my grandparents brought four of their six children from Iowa to North Dakota and bought what was part of a, a Dalrymple Bonanza farm. But they were not the original owners because my dad would find, uh, I've forgotten the word, the, the little... Uh, Pottery shards Arrow, or arrowheads? Yeah. Arrowheads mm -hmm. on the land. And how do I find who, who was there? Oh, yeah. So, first of all, all of us human beings, our cultures shift and change far more quickly than anyone realizes. So, so for example, I don't know anyone, if you've ever had to read Geoffrey Chaucer, he was one of the first people to write stuff down in, in English. Yeah, I can barely read that stuff. But he, he was writing like 600 years ago. One of the first things ever written in English. And in only 600 years of change, I'm a pretty good English speaker, and I can barely understand that. Right? So, so the question about who becomes a little bit complex, because if you say who is living in England, you know, well, 9,000 years ago, it wasn't someone who called himself an Englishman. No. You know, they were people from Celtic tribes, but that same DNA is in the Englishmen who are living there now, mm -hmm. even though the identity, language, culture has shifted and changed. So that's also the case with us indigenous folks. In this part of the world, um, the last major ice age retreated about 11,000 years ago, and there have been people living here constantly ever since. So, for example, the remains of what they sometimes call Minnesota woman, um, just over um, by Pequot Lakes, was dated to around 10,000 years ago. Um, and in fact, a lot of the Red River Valley and the northwestern part of Minnesota was part of a proglacial lake, Lake Agassiz. Um, and actually, I think that's where you're, you know, it's in the name for your library system here, too. You know, as it, as it drained, you know, the sediment from that huge proglacial lake settled here. It's one of the richest, like, when white folk looked at it, they're like, richest swath of grade A agricultural land in the U.S. and Canada. You know what I mean? When natives looked at it, they're like, most dense population of bison. You know, the migratory pathways for ducks and geese, you know, abundant honestly, even until just the early 1900s, abundant moose and woodland caribou here. Um, a lot of people don't realize that. And uh, 
And so all of that stuff shifted and changed. So my ancestors, their DNA is quite ancient. In fact, the, the um, genomic research has identified that the indigenous population has been separated from the rest of humans for at least 30,000 years. Uh, and so that's longer than people had previously believed. And I don't know, Vine Deloria said, they're going to find something tomorrow and it'll tell you all those moccasin prints across the Bering Strait were pointing in the opposite direction. <laughs> you know, and, and who's to say otherwise? There's just new stuff coming all the time. But ultimately, here, you know, right now, the indigenous groups in this area include Dakota and Ojibwe, but predating, you know, that, you actually have um, even Cheyenne, Hidatsa, um, Mandan, other groups that are further out in North Dakota um, had homes here. And even folks like William Warren found earthen lodges, which only the three affiliated tribes build, um, all over Minnesota. And that was, you know, probably built in the 1700s, um, you know, possibly as late as 1800 for some of them. So that's not that, ling that long ago. Uh, but the Ojibwe, you know, are more recent arrivals than the Dakota, you know. And if you're looking at your farm in eastern North Dakota, you know, the short answer, I would say that's Dakota country. Um, you know, most recently, prior to that, some of these other tribes likely had habitations there. And you go back several thousand years, there was some tribe, you know, who are our predecessors that we descend from but they might have even called themselves something totally different. I had heard many years ago that the Native Americans, the Indians, were put on reservations to keep them away from the white folks, the good white folks. Uh, excuse me, but it, it really troubled me that that's, that was the reason for a reservation. Mm -hmm. And have you read that or studied that or heard yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, it's part of the colonial process. And colonization, you know, it's, it's not fun. But ultimately, like, if you look at the indigenous population in the Americas at the time of contact, like Columbus, there were estimated about 100 million people here. The population of Europe at the time was about 88 million. And so we've often received mythology about scattered bands of roaming nomads in the wilderness as, as a way to say there was room for everybody else. And everyone else's coming was not somehow a taking. But there's no way around it. It was. It was. And from the first boatload of pilgrims, the natives saw them and freaked out at the strange, pale, hairy folks and ran away. And the first boatload of pilgrims came and stole all their food. That was the first thing that happened. It wasn't a Thanksgiving, you know? And ever since, there was an effort to supplant, and this is what colonization does, to supplant the original inhabitants of the land and move them further west and concentrate them onto reservations you know, and then sometimes say, you need to give up your reservation and move it to a new one, uh, and constantly changing the, the landscape. Today, reservations are a little different. So they were created as places to get us away from everyone else. And by the way, even inside reservations, they also carved that up too. So there was a policy called allotment, where they chopped up the reservations into little chunks, and then allotted them to individual members and opened up the rest for white settlement. So like the Oklahoma land rushes, they didn't just take place on what was native land, they took place inside Indian reservations. So Leech Lake, where I'm from, native people own 4% of our reservation. Yeah, White Earth, native people own 9% of the reservation. Most of the land is owned by non-native people including most of the prime real estate, lakeshore lots and that kind of stuff. So, you know, that stuff is just not very fun or cool. But one of the things now is that 
for a whole variety of reasons, and I'm happy to go into them if you want, about the structure and nature of sovereignty and things like that, reservations aren't just like the leftovers that we were forced onto. They're now also our homelands. Um, they're places that are the, the geographical space for our native nations. Um, we've been living there for a long time. We love them. Uh, in a place like Minnesota, you know, Native people have kept land on the 10 largest lakes in the state, not by accident. They had to work really hard to keep that. Um, they shouldn't have had to work so hard, uh, but they did. Uh, and so what we have is not, you know, horrible, and there's not, you know, barbed wire keeping us in. Like, I drove over here today without any problems. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so it's not just, you know... It's not just about oppression, although certainly that was the story of their genesis. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for coming. Very interesting. A question um, you talked about Ojibwe is, you know, really scattered geographically, and yet here in Fargo-Moorhead we hear a lot about the White Earth Band of Ojibwe. Does each band sort of determine membership? You mentioned you're half native. Uh, is there a, a different uh, ancestry that would qualify uh, a member? <laughs> and does that vary by band or the, the tribe? Could you speak a little to that? Because it's sure. confusing. The answer is yes. OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's a great question. And yes, it's confusing to everybody, including the natives. Yeah. So. First of all, every marginalized group in the country has an issue with, like, pedigrees. Um, you know, like, what does it mean to be black? You know, and there was, there was a political criteria that said one drop, you know, means you are going to be a slave, you know. But uh, socially, even today, across the spectrum, there's, there's an internal and an external social dynamic. So folks like W.E.B. Du Bois and James Baldwin have written a lot about the color line. Like the darker you are, the more onerous your treatment uh, in society and things like that. That being said, that's a social dimension. There's a political dimension that's different for Native people because we're not just you know, ethnic or racial groupings. We're also, we have Native nations. They have a, a distinct political status. And initially, you know, a group like Ojibwe or Dakota, you know, there were structures and alliances, but at the same time, probably the everyday life was governed a little more by village, you know? So um, you would, you know, if somebody from the other village was trading somewhere, traveling somewhere, deciding to go pick berries or whatever, like that wouldn't affect you. You just do what your village is doing, you know? Uh, but as the U.S. government started in with the treaty period, they tried to group people from multiple villages together in one place. So like White Earth is a prime example. You know, they put chiefs and people from 20 different villages onto one res. So who's going to be chief of them all? Created all kinds of problems. And then for criteria to be a member, they said you need to prove and this is right at the birth of the eugenics movement. It was started up in the late 1800s and early 1900s. You need to prove a certain percentage of blood that comes from that community. So uh, for most of the tribes, it was established as 25%. And most of them still have proving 25% of your blood from that community as the criteria for enrollment. It's really flawed and it's kind of contentious. So. The reasons that it's flawed is that's not an indigenous criteria. It would be if you're part of the village and you're part of the people, then, then you are part of the people. You know, it was, it was really kind of that simple. But once the political definitions evolved, they really got regimented. And for example, like the US government, when they're doing allotment, chopping up the reservations, White Earth again is a great example because. Um, there was a law that said we have to protect these poor natives from losing their land right away. So there's a 25 year period called a trust period when they could not sell their land, their private allotment. And then most of them lost their land right away anyways. 
people came in, here's five bucks, give me that piece of paper. Sometimes like Joe Aganosh um, from Rice Lake said, check this out. And he showed me a grocery receipt for $24. He said, you know what that is? That's my family's allotment. The grocery clerk said that my dad had charged up goods at his store, went in to the allotment officer and said, I need, he'll never pay me. I need his land in, in payment for this bill and got his whole allotment. So the trust period never, never worked. But later on in the 19 teens, there was a, a court case. And because initially there, with the Burke Act, it said full-blooded Indians can't sell their land, but the mixed bloods are part white, therefore part competent, so they can sell their land, <laughs> right? That was basically what the law said. So then they had to determine who's a mixed blood and who's a full blood. So at White Earth, there were 5,000 people who said, I lost my land and I'm a full blood and never should have been taken from me. So they had to determine who's mixed blood, who's full blood. So they brought up a couple scientists. One was from the University of Minnesota. One was from the Smithsonian. And it's almost comical what they did, but they, they measured craniums, the height of cheekbones. They did a scratch test, so they scratched the skin. If it turns a different color, clearly a, a mixed blood. And they went from over 5,000 people claiming to be full bloods who were defrauded to 126. And those records are still the criteria for who can be an enrolled member at White Earth today. It's supercharged now on a couple levels. So if you're from a tribe that does per capita payments from a casino, the thought of changing the criteria for tribal enrollment and expanding the roles means you get less money. So there's a financial incentive not to change it, even though there might be a cultural incentive to change it. Also, places like White Earth are part of a larger organization called the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe, so changing their constitution requires dealing with all the other tribes. I think eventually they'll sort that one out but it's taken a painfully long time to do so. Some tribes have just said, forget this blood quantum stuff, it's alien and foreign, it's designed to have us bred into extinction. And so like the Cherokee Nation said, and you know, descendant from an original member, you're a member. Um, Red Cliff Band of Ojibwe in Wisconsin did the same thing. St. Croix Band of Ojibwe in Wisconsin said, you gotta prove half native blood and they um, you know, bumped it up. Some of the Apache tribes did that too. The only argument I've heard opposed to it that makes sense to me is that some people say, well, those who've stayed, those who've kept the language and culture alive, you know, and have suffered more, whether or not that's true, um, are concerned that if we change the criteria, we'll be enrolling anybody who's ever seen a native hunting for a scholarship. <laughs> and the ideas about you know, the importance of our language, culture, and community will be marginalized in that greater polity. So, in my view, and this is not universally had pe held because people have some very strong opinions on all sides of this, my view is do away with blood quantum. It's not an indigenous criteria. The politics of exclusion are harmful and painful and don't serve us well. Any nation with a declining birth rate like Italy or Japan has declining power on the national stage. We should be open and inviting to our own citizenry. We're increasingly multiracial. And you can have a strong residency requirement for holding tribal office as a way to mitigate the concerns about you know, um, outsiders controlling the politics. Um, you could even limit you know, financial benefits for those who are resident on the reservation or something if need be. But I don't see any reason to exclude our own people. Others might fight me on that though. Mm -hmm. Probably have time for a couple more. Yeah. Go right ahead. Yep. Say, we have an easy one. Do you have siblings? Do I have siblings? I do. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so my father was married twice. So I have three older half brothers from his first marriage, and then I have another uh, two brothers and a sister from the second batch. Yep. And my my youngest brother, he's a he's an ER doc in Bemidji at the hospital. My sister went into the law, and so she's got a, she's a judge now, too. And then my other brother's also got a PhD and writes books. Awesome. Yep, David. Yep. I'm going to ask you a, a slightly harder question, and then I'll let Jackie ask her question, and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah. So can you explain how tribal government and law enforcement works, and how 
also, if at all, does it work with state governments? <laughs> I've been hearing a lot. <laughs> this is a very, it's a very heartfelt question. So thank you, Jill, for giving this question. Uh, I've been hearing a lot about women going missing, um, but little being done from state law enforcement to help find them. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah. All right, so there's a lot to unpack. We need to sign you all up for some Indigenous Studies 101 classes because there really is a lot to it. Um, I'll try to like give you the Reader's Digest versions of this, um, shorten it up a little bit. Essentially, if you go way back to the founding of America, our Constitution's pretty interesting. In some ways, our Constitution was created mainly to um, enable the institution of slavery and, and the arguments about states' rights were not necessarily about equity, but it was like, how do we have some states that want to have people own other people united in a government with other states where they don't want people to own other people? So the way you do that is you push everything to states' rights, and you just define a few very narrow federal rights, which include an army for the common defense, a system of taxation and laws, you know, around commerce and things like that. But natives are one of those things that's defined as a federal power. So in the Constitution, it's called the Trade and Intercourse Clause. It says, only Congress shall regulate trade and manage affairs between the several states and the various Indian tribes. And the way that's been understood um, constitutionally and through all kinds of court cases has been only the US federal government can mess around with the natives, the state governments can't. And that's why, for example, when state governments say gaming and gambling is illegal, except for pull tabs, powerball, and church bingo, then uh, <laughs> those laws don't apply to the natives. So they can have a full-fledged casino operation, you know, even if that's not you know, enabled under state laws. Most of our lives are governed by state laws, so all of the civil jurisdiction, like even you know, the federal government doesn't say you can't kill people. State governments say you can't kill people, and that's why some states have a death penalty and some don't, and you know, there's so much variation in our system. So um, that sets up essentially one of the jurisdictional issues. Over time, you know, the US federal government has messed around with tribal sovereignty, so in the late 1800s, they passed the Major Crimes Act that said for these major crimes, and they were murder, rape, and then the rest were all property crimes like, you know, arson and larceny and things like that. Um, for those crimes, the U.S. federal government will assume jurisdiction over tribes. And so they started growing the federal control over tribes through the legal system, through acts of Congress. And then further complicating things in the 1950s, the federal government passed a law to experiment with giving states some control over some criminal affairs, but only in some places. So it's weird, but in, in Minnesota, for example, that law called Public Law 280 applied to the whole state, except for Red Lake and Boys Fort. And so it's so strange if someone, you know, if a native kills a native, at Leech Lake, you're gonna have a state law enforcement agency that investigates. If a native kills a native at Red Lake, you'll get a federal law enforcement agency that investigates. And so it's different in different places. So that gets complex. Also, for the most part, tribes have not been given jurisdiction over non-tribal members. And so one of the issues that comes up with regard to missing and murdered indigenous women is that most crime in America is white on white and black on black and so forth, except crimes of sexual violence perpetrated against native women are predominantly perpetrated by white men. And the sexual assault rates, by the way, in America are 25%, they are 50% for native women. And then the tribes cannot arrest, charge, or prosecute people who come on a reservation and sexually assault a native woman. So there was some legislation designed to address that called, in, as part of the Violence Against Women Act that would establish jurisdiction for sexual assaults of native women. The problem is the law is kind of weak 
and it needs constant reauthorization by Congress. So it's pretty common that it'll get held up and not reauthorized for a while, um, and there'll be gaps in coverage, and it just makes it very difficult to protect Native women. Uh, and so that's, that's an issue with the legal system, and it's the reason that there is a lot of advocacy around it, not just because there's a legal loophole, but frankly because as a result of it, you have numerous missing and murdered indigenous women in the United States and a similar issue in Canada, um, even though the jurisdictional issues are a little different there. And so um, it's, a really important, uh, it's a really important topic that impacts everybody. And frankly, you know, instead of having a just us view, you know, about things, we kind of need a justice view about these sorts of things to fully humanize everybody who lives in this country and to protect everybody who lives in this country. And the fact that things like the health and safety of other human beings are even made to be a political issue um, is, is pretty disturbing. But that's how those things connect, a kind of in a, in a nutshell, even though there's a lot more to unpack with all of the different jurisdictional things and, and so forth. I will say this, there are some rays of, of you know, sunshine and hope too, because some of the tribes are working out joint jurisdiction um, task forces with municipal and state and federal law enforcement agencies. So in Red Lake, they work with a federal task force on you know, gang and drug interventions. Um, at White Earth, they actually have you know, state and tribal law enforcement um, personnel who are cross-deputized. Um, in some places, like in Mille Lacs, the local, you know, state and local law enforcement agencies are really resistant to working with the tribes. They're adversarial with them, and it's not working out there. But in some places, it is. Um, it shouldn't have to be a checkerboard. It, there, we should be able to just implement and provide for jurisdiction. For the most part, a lot of people just don't trust tribes and tribal people yet. You know, it, it's, it's an attitudinal thing that provides the resistance to the structural support that would actually make people safer. My question is, in Albuquerque recently, um, several unmarked graves or remains have been found on the site of the Albuquerque Indian School. There are lots of ideas about how that should be handled, and I'm just asking you what your idea is. Oh, all right. So I don't know, have, have you been following this a little bit in the news? Um, so there's a lot going on with the stories around residential boarding schools, both in the United States and in Canada. The governments, and by the way, this happened in Australia and other places too. The governments established residential boarding schools for the indigenous populations um, and used them as a means of eradicating indigenous languages and cultures. Um, Canada had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and among the findings were that the Canadian government engaged in genocide. Those are the findings of the, the government's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We haven't gotten as far as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission here in the United States. I think it would be a healthy step to do that. Um, if, you know, I read the Desmond Tutu book, The Book of Forgiving, and he was, you know, he won a Nobel Peace Prize, and he was very active in, um, you know, in South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Amazing stories. This woman who formed a peace institute with the men who had murdered her daughter. Uh, can't imagine the grace for all of them doing that, you know. But he says when there's been an injury, whether it's an individual injury or a historical injustice. It's really important to first of all tell the story. And we may need to tell that story over and over again and retell that story. And then we need to name the hurt and say here's what that was, genocide or whatever. Then we can forgive. And then we can either renew or release the relationship. So with an individual injury, if some dude goes out, cheats on his wife, and then wants to reconcile the relationship, he's not going to get very far if he says, forget about it, it all happened in the past. <laughs> right? He's got to listen to the story, 
how that felt, provide answers, talk about what that meant for both of them, say that will never happen again, mean it, be believed, and then hear a label put to it that was betrayal, that was painful, that was disappointing, and then he'll either get a reconciliation or a divorce, right? And so if you don't allow the telling of the story, there's no chance for the reconciliation. It, it shuts it down. And America fundamentally shuts it down. Won't hold space. In fact, you can see it right now. Don't talk about race in schools. Shut it down. You know, don't talk about race and, in, 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 you know, don't talk about bad things that Columbus did. You know, shut it down. Don't talk about bad things that Confederate generals did. Shut that down too. You know, like it's crazy. But if we hold space for the telling of the story, the retelling of the story, you know, and it's why sometimes when we have mixed company, someone wants to talk about residential boarding schools or something else, and it's because there's an injury that needs to be voiced so it can be healed, so it can be reconciled. So part of the work is holding space for each other, truly listening to one another's stories. Hurt people hurt people, you know? With regard to residential boarding schools in particular, we've now identified this system started in the United States in 1879. It was the dominant way that Native kids were educated through World War II, and then there's been a slow fade after that. There's actually still four U.S. government-run boarding schools for Native kids in operation today. Um, although those schools have been reformed and they're not keeping graves for kids or beating them for speaking their tribal languages, that there's even a vestigial remnant of the policy is still a little strange. And some of them are quite close to us, you know, Flandreau and Wapaton, you know. But ultimately, um, as we think about where do we go from here, you know, some of the schools, especially in Canada, had big mass graves. Um, the schools in the U.S., like Carlisle, Haskell, other big ones, kept cemeteries. Usually they marked the graves, but not always. There, there were quite a few unknowns um, and some mass graves that were found there, too. So just imagine sending your kid to school and not getting a body back. There's a, there's a lot of pain there. Or having religious choice over the kind of send-off your kid would have. But ultimately, I think going forward, we need to make space to actually have the conversations so we can reconcile. And rather than a big national policy so much, I think each local community should be empowered, um, or the families, the families whose you know, ancestors were at the schools, to have some voice in the proper remedy. So some places, you know, the families have petitioned for repatriation of remains and a reburial. Um, others have said, their spirits in the spirit world, let their bodies lay right where they are. Um, so I would hesitate to tell a family, you're going to do it my way, not your way. Um, I think it's important to empower them in, in those decisions about specific cases. Um, as a general rule of thumb, we do have something called the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act that provides some guidance and protocol for repatriation of remains. Um, it doesn't have any punishments for anyone who fails to do so. But I think there's a little guidance that could be grown and strengthened that might help in the process. Um, but ultimately, America's usually gotten it wrong when they've said, we know better than the natives what's best for natives, and they come up with something like residential boarding schools. So better to say, all right, native people, what do you want? And we will help do that in the interests of justice. Yeah. Thank you all for your questions. There were many of them that were very good, and you haphazardly actually got to some of them without me even asking them, so thank you. <laughs> um, let's give Anton another round of applause. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. All right, I appreciate all of you. So outside the door, there's free food, <laughs> cookies, coffee, tea, and I'm going to walk straight out the door. I'll mask up first so when we're close to each other, I'll be fully masked. I'll come to one of those tables there, and so we can schmooze. I'll answer more questions, and I will sign books.
Anything else? That's it. Okay, miigwech. Thank you.